Good afternoon, and welcome to the Four Arts. I'm Sophia Maduro, Chief Programs Officer. Could I ask everyone to please put their phones on silent mode? Thank you. So Alzheimer's can be among the most emotionally and financially devastating diseases to those afflicted, to the families, to their caregivers. So we thought we'd give you um, a message of hope one that shares suggestions on how to reduce our risk of getting Alzheimer's. And for that, we've brought probably the world's leading expert, Dr. Rudy Tanzi, chairman of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund Research, which is a nonprofit dedicated to funding research with the highest probability of preventing, slowing, or reversing Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Tanzi holds a position named after a couple known and beloved for their Palm Beach connection, among others, the Joseph and Rose Kennedy Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. At Mass General, he's Vice Chair of the Neurology Department, the Director of Genetics and in the Aging Research Unit, and his distinctions and titles are too long to mention, so I'm glad that they're all written here on the screen and you can read them. Dr. Tanzi has received worldwide recognition for his pioneering studies of neurogenetic disease and groundbreaking efforts to prevent and cure Alzheimer's, including two of the highest awards for the research. And his groundbreaking work has also earned him designation as Harvard University, one of the 100 most influential alumni. Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people in the world and the Smithsonian's Ingenuity Award, which is the nation's highest honor for invention and innovation, and some of his research is actually exhibited at, at the Smithsonian. He's also a New York Times bestselling author, who's co-authored numerous books, including three bestsellers with Deepak Chopra, one on the super brain, one on the super genes, G-E-N-E-S, and the most recent book, the Healing Self, a revolutionary plan to supercharge your immunity and stay well for life. Many of you will have seen him as a popular guest on the news and television shows, and he's created special medical shows specifically about his work for PBS. Now, some of you may rightly be wondering, and what is the Four Arts connection? I want to, you all to know that Dr. Tanzi is a man of many talents, very accomplished jazz pianist who studied at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester and has performed with Renee Fleming and plays the keyboard with several popular rock bands, including Joe Perry with Aerosmith. And he co-wrote with Chris Mann the tribute to Alzheimer's patients that's now sort of the anthem of the Alzheimer's aptly called Remember Me. In fact, he was joking to me before this talk, saying that his music gets downloaded more from his website than his groundbreaking medical papers. <laughs> so um, you'll see, fascinating topic, fascinating man, and there will be a reception just outside to follow for those of you who want to talk and ask questions and learn more about this. Please join me in welcoming, finally, because this was planned for 2020 and because of COVID, we had to cancel it. Finally, welcome to the stage, Dr. Rudy Townsend. Thank you, Sophia, for, I have to remember for my eulogy when I finally go. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction. Um, thank you all for being here um, in a beautiful afternoon and coming to share some time to talk about Alzheimer's disease. And what I'm going to give you today is good news. I know in Alzheimer's you hear mostly bad news, but I'm going to tell you that our efforts are largely supported by the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, who's together with the Society for sponsoring today's event, um, that we're doing well. And I think we're on our way to the next few years being really just game changing for how we uh, deal with Alzheimer's. I'm going to tell you in advance the punchline of my talk, which is the key to ending Alzheimer's is to detect it early and intervene early. That doesn't mean we abandon the patients who are suffering now. We have a strategy for them as well. But I'll go through all of that. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've been at uh, Mass General 
And in the Harvard system, this is my 43rd year <laughs> from student to professor. I never left. Um, way back when, uh, in uh, the early 80s, I worked with Jim Gasella. Uh, we were the first ones to ever use genetics to find a disease gene. At that time, there was really no genetic studies to find genes for disease, but we found the Huntington's disease gene uh, back in the early 80s, and that really prompted this hope that, hey, if we understand the human genome and we can tackle these diseases where we have no idea what causes them, like at that time, the movement disorder Huntington's, we can get the genes and understand them. And that gave rise, of course, to the need for the Human Genome Project. And it was around 1982, for purposes of doing something as a student that was different than my mentor, I, I started studying Down syndrome. And as some of you may know, Down syndrome subjects go on by middle age to get Alzheimer's pathology. And I shamelessly speculated as a student at Harvard Medical School that maybe there was an Alzheimer's gene and maybe it was going to be on chromosome 21, because that's the extra chromosome they have in Down syndrome. And although I was told not to do it, and, and I was going to waste my time as a student, luckily I didn't listen. Um, and sure enough, the first Alzheimer's gene was, the, was, the, was on chromosome 21, and, and it ended up being the amyloid gene. And since then, I've worked on amyloid. So first, let me ask, how many of you have heard of amyloid in the brain? OK, good. How many of you have read articles saying amyloid doesn't matter in Alzheimer's disease? A few. OK. So I'm going to set that straight and tell you that amyloid does cause this disease, but it does so the way high cholesterol eventually leads to heart disease. And I'm going to tell you that just like if someone needs a coronary bypass, the doc doesn't say, here, just take some Lipitor. You had to take the Lipitor, the cholesterol medications, 20 years before. We have to hit amyloid 20 years before Alzheimer's hits. That's going to be a big message today. And we have to hit other pathologies to treat actual patients. So that's just a little preview of what I'll talk about. Let me ask another question. How many of you have had or have an Alzheimer's patient in your family? Raise your hands. OK. And how many of you, if you don't have an Alzheimer's patient in your family, or either family or have friends, a friend or a friend's family who has Alzheimer's disease? So that's just about everybody. So this is a really prevalent disease. It's 7 million people in this country, 7 million. And if you take how many people have Alzheimer's pathology already brewing in their brains that don't yet have symptoms of cognitive impairment or dementia, it's estimated to be 40 million, 4 zero. So very similar to people who have high cholesterol right, some plaque forming in their arteries. They want to avoid congestive heart failure. And what I'm going to tell you is that we don't diagnose Alzheimer's disease until the equivalent, if it was heart disease, that you already have congestive heart failure. Imagine that. We don't diagnose Alzheimer's disease, if it was diabetes, until you lost half of your beta cells in your pancreas. Do we do that? No. We check cholesterol, right? We have EKGs. We check glucose levels. We get ahead of these other age-related diseases. But Alzheimer's disease is basically far behind. Um, Harvard requires me showing you the companies that I've worked at over the last five years. It could be a one-day consulting. could be a company I began, but I just want to make sure that I show that. And I might talk today particularly about work I'm doing with Amelix and active pharmaceuticals and a little bit about React Neuro, so just for purposes of disclosure. And you see down there where it says Sony Records, that's my Aerosmith royalty. <laughs> so that doesn't mean, but I have to show that too, believe it or not, because that's on the last Aerosmith album. Um, so um, some good news. Um, thanks to modern medicine, we're now living longer than ever. The average lifespan is 80 years old. And if you're you know, living with a good lifestyle and you have the means, you know, we can expect to live well into our 90s. The bad news is, our, is a a huge growing gap between our lifespan and our health span. Right? We all want to live longer, but does our health keep up? And in particular, our brain health span is lagging way behind our lifespan. If you look at the chart on the, on the, um, on the left here, what you'll see is that in, in 1960, this, the age distribution from you know, uh, teens up to 85 plus was a pyramid. Right? As you went up, you had much fewer. By 2060, this pyramid is going to look more like a pillar. We're all growing older thanks to modern medicine. But if we don't stop Alzheimer's disease, we're going to crush Medicare, crush Medicaid, crush the healthcare system. It's too expensive a disease. 
40% of people over 80 have already begun symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. 7 million Americans. And like I said, this pathology begins two to three decades before. We have 40 million people right now we can help to stave off this disease in the future. And that's going to be one of our main goals we talk about today. And this is the elephant in the room I was mentioning, that we don't diagnose diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, ALS, Huntington's, all the neurodegenerative disorders. We don't diagnose them until you have symptoms. At that point, your brain has already deteriorated to the point that it's not functioning right. This is not what we do in diabetes or heart disease. We have to get to a state where we have early detection, early intervention, and nip this disease in the bud at an early stage. And that's what I'm going to tell you how we're going to do that. So this just, just shows that in heart disease. We look at cholesterol, blood pressure, cancer. We might do a mammography or PSA. For brain health, what do we do when you go to the doc? Basically nothing. You might get a, a mini, like a mental exam, like a MOCA, but we don't physically look for indicators that the brain's going downhill. We don't do what we do for cancer, diabetes, heart disease for the brain, and that's what we really have to change. And now we're at the cusp right now of having all the technology we need to do so. Every one of you, if you wish, if you wanted to pay out of pocket, could go get a blood test right now and find out if you have amyloid in your brain. Okay? And if you wanted to pay out of pocket, you could buy the new Alzheimer's immunotherapy that removes amyloid and remove your amyloid. See, the thing is, if you're off means right now, you can do that. You can pay out of pocket to know you have amyloid in your brain and get rid of it. You, many of you, how, many of you, how many of you knew that before I just said it? So a few. So imagine that. If, you know, now, of course, this creates, it, you, you know, obviously, healthcare disparity. You know, if you have the means, you can say, I'll pay out of pocket $1,500 for the blood test. I'll pay $5,000 for a PET scan right now to see if I do have amyloid in my brain and verify it. I will pay for Lakembi, the new Alzheimer's immunotherapy from Azi. I can, I can, it's, it's approved. I can buy it off label. It will cost $26,500. I have to pay for six MRIs to make sure my brain doesn't have side effects like hemorrhage or swelling, that, and that will bring the total price to $100,000. What I'm going to tell you that, is that because of that, because we're already there, now we can think about how to do it in a much more affordable, safer way, how we can democratize this process and hopefully work the FDA so that everybody can find out, just like with cholesterol tests and heart disease, they can find out if they have pathology brewing in their brain decades before symptoms and do something about it. And do something about this statistic that shows every other disease, either even or going downhill, heart disease, stroke, HIV, only Alzheimer's, from 20, 2000 to 2019, up 145%. It's unacceptable. And like I said, if this continues with, as we grow older and older, we're going to have a lot of trouble. So what does Alzheimer's do? In, in a nutshell, in Alzheimer's, you lose synapses. Synapses are the connections between the neurons in your brain. It's your neural network. So if you just go through it, you have 100 billion neurons. I always feel like Carl Sagan when I say that, 100 billion neurons. And, um, now, in a newborn, we'll have 50 trillion connections between those 100 billion neurons, 50 trillion synapses. By the time you have a two-year-old throwing tantrums, he's, that two-year-old is the smartest kid on the planet. They have a quadrillion synapses. Nothing gets past them. That's why they're throwing tantrums. They're like, what's wrong with your people? I got quadrillion synapses. I got to deal with you with 500 trillion. So, so what happens is as, as when you're a toddler, you know, mom and dad, your teachers, your siblings, they sculpt you and they say, look, get over the tantrum. This is the real world. And little by little, you get rid of all these synapses. You start sculpting them down. And now you're forming your framework of the world. Your brain is bringing you the world that's been guided by your, your teachers, your parents, your siblings. And then you suddenly have 500 trillion synapses. And this is a neural network. And every experience you have, even right now, these neurons, this neuroplasticity, these synapses are changing and reforming and redeveloping. As you're learning new things right now, you're hearing what I say, you're making new synapses that connect by association with older synapses to put what I'm telling you that you're learning that's new with what you already knew. That's how we learn, put the new in association with the old. So this is, in this whole neural network, every experience we have creating this neural network that maps our world for us creates our sense of self. So let's say this is what it looks like. Well, in Alzheimer's disease, over time, the problem is these synapses just slowly get destroyed. 
So by removing this tapestry of your sense of self in your neural network, you formed all your life, with every experience you have, every person you've loved, your family and friends, this disease is a thief that insidiously robs you of who you are and you from your loved ones. It's, it's, and most people in surveys will say of diseases they fear most, they list Alzheimer's above cancer and all the diseases for that reason. Okay. So how did it start? Well, for modern purposes in 1906, this guy, August Alzheimer's, I mean, Alois Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer, had this patient um, here, August Dieter. She was 55 years old. She was in this uh, fine facility called Ehrenschloss, Castle of the Insane. They weren't so careful with names back then. And, um, and, and uh, he said that she was admitted to the asylum with memory loss, hallucinations. She would scream for hours in the middle of the night, oh God, I've lost myself. Because that's what this disease is. You lose your sense of who you are. Right? She's only 55. She's tormented. Later on, she'll not even know it. She'll become more vegetative. And when she died, he noticed her neurons had these wispy tangle things in them, called tangles, and he saw these big blobs around the neurons. We call those amyloid plaques. And he and others like Oscar Fisher first described this pathology. And he presented it in Bavaria at a big meeting, and Carl Jung and all these big people in the audience, and Alzheimer's said, I think that these physical lesions I found in her brain was what made her go mad and have hallucinations and lose her memory. They laughed at him. They said, you, what? You're saying physical changes in the brain cause mental um, consequences? Impossible. No one believed him. So it took decades for that to become something we take for granted now. So now Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia in the elderly. People say, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Dementia is the umbrella term. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. Seven million patients, one in nine over 65 have it. Probably costs well over 400 billion per year. Like I said, if you take people who have the pathology without symptoms, it's probably 38, 40 million. Risk factors include number one, age, family history, stroke, brain injury, sex. Don't worry, sex isn't a risk factor. That's, we, can't, we don't say gender in science because gender is is, is, is not the same as sex, so we have to say sex, but sex is fine. Um, uh, women make up two-thirds of Alzheimer's disease uh, patients, so this is very much a woman's disease. We're trying to understand why, how that is the case, that so many patients are women. Um, and the number of cases is going to triple by 2050. These are the other diseases for dementia. Alzheimer's is 60 to 80 percent. Cerebrovascular disease due to stroke, 5 to 10 percent. Frontal lobe degeneration, where you have the tangles but not the plaques is 3%, uh, and so on, hippocampal sclerosis, Lewy body disease, 5%, mixed pathologies in these diseases, 50% of patients, and 4% get dementia because of the progression of Parkinson's disease. But Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. So many people say, if you look across this you know, continuum from no symptoms, mild cognitive impairment, then dementia due to uh, at the mild stage, moderate stage, finally the severe stage, what are senior moments, right? So senior moments kind of sit here, right? You, you, you have these little flashes of just, why did I walk in the room, right? You know, when, you, when you, you walk into a room and the cat follows you into the room, and then you stop and you say, why, 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 why did I come in here? And the cat looks up at you and says, I know why. You were going to give me some food. You were going to give me a treat. So they say, okay, thank you, cat. Um, so this is a, a senior moments, and th these are just some, you know, uh, cartoons I found, you'll be pleased to know that the doctor has successfully moved the word that was on the tip of your tongue. Um, I've forgotten what I'm on hold for. Uh, and there is actually a game called Senior Moments, if you can believe it. That's not, that's not fake. Well, the reason why we can have these senior moments without Alzheimer's is this. Learning and memory is reinforced by emotion, attention, and passion in the moment. So. If you're old enough, do you, you probably remember, I remember I was, I was five years old when Kennedy got shot. I remember exactly what I was doing. I was only five. I remember when the shuttle exploded. I remember when 9-11 occurred, right? You all remember these things like to the, to the T of, every, of exactly what was happening because the emotion, which is in the amygdala, hardwires the memory in the hippocampus, which is in this part of the brain here. Well, now think about kids, right? 
kids are, are learning really well. They have lots of synapses, but everything's really exciting, right? For kids, you have lots of wow moments, right? Then you get older and you have so what moments. So you're like, yeah, yeah, I've been there, done that. Yeah, kid, get over it, you know? So this is the problem is that as we get older, we're less excited and wowed about the moment, so the emotion isn't there to, heart, to, to make learning as easy. This can lead to get a loss of bandwidth, being just, you know, overloaded with what you have to do, which um, leads to these moments. With age, we can tend to become too busy, jaded, just pay less attention. But when these memory lapses challenge daily living, it might be the beginning of Alzheimer's. We also call this the twinkle to wrinkle syndrome, right? <laughs> There's the kid, the twinkle in the eyes, and then, yeah, 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 been there, done that. So this is what we want to avoid. But sometimes it's more. Sometimes it means that as these signals are coming into the hippocampus, and they have to be like, you know, these, your sensory signals, photons hit your eyes, uh, sound waves hit your ears. You, these, are sense, these are just signals, and they have to be turned into meaningful information. They have to mean something, and that's what the hippocampus does. So like when a baby sees a red shoe, the baby doesn't know what it is, right? There's, there's, there's this photon sitting in the eye, red, shape of a shoe. Then later they realize, oh, that's my mother's shoe, right? So what happens in Alzheimer's is the signals come in, but as the neurons are lost in this part of the brain called the hippocampus, um, which is, means seahorse in Greek. See, this is the hippocampus here. Looks a lot like a seahorse. They were invented back then. Um, but as those neurons that turn signals into meaningful information are lost, then you start to lose your sense of self. Okay? So that's why an Alzheimer patient who's advanced might go to the fridge and take out food that's rotted, green with mold, smells terrible. The sensory signals come in. It smells bad. I see green fungus on it. But the meaningful information say, this is bad food, don't eat it, that doesn't turn up, and they might eat that food. Okay. So these are all of the um, differences between Alzheimer's and age-related changes, you know, where memory loss disrupts your lifestyle versus forgetting names. You have challenges in planning versus just occasional errors in being able to you know, plan your day. Uh, you have difficulty with familiar tasks like using the microwave or an item you use every day, versus just an occasional lapse and say, oh, how can I forget you know, how to use the, the leaf blower? Um, you have confusion with time every day and where you are, versus just forgetting what day of the week it is. Problems with driving and judging distance is common in Alzheimer's, versus you might just have cataracts or maybe macular degeneration. Problems with speaking, making sentences, writing language, aphasia, versus just tip of the tongue syndrome. Can't think of the name, it's the tip of the tongue. Um, you, you, you might lose something, but you can't retrace your steps. You just cannot find your way back when you misplace something versus misplace and eventually, if it takes a day, retrace, right? Um, continual poor judgment versus just the occasional bad decision that we all make. And then finally, social withdrawal. You just don't want to be around people anymore versus, you know, just um, occasionally not wanting to um, uh, uh, say the wrong thing. And changes in personality that are pretty uh, profound versus just once in a while being irritable, especially as you get older, if your routine is upset, you might become irritable. That's different than the actual personality change. So this is what causes the disease. Here's the amyloid that Alzheimer found in his patient. And the amyloid plaques, the sticky material outside of the neurons, for which we first found the gene, causes inside the neurons the tangles. This was described by Alzheimer in 1906. Now, what I'm going to tell you is if you only have amyloid, which is kind of like a match, and that, lights, that causes the tangles, which are like brush fires, the tangles spread and propagate through the brain. If that's all that happens, you will not get the disease. It's not enough. These brush fires of tangles in the amyloid have to trigger neuroinflammation. And it's inflammation that causes the forest fire. And this causes 10 times more loss of synapses and neurons than the original plaques and tangles that got you there. By the way, this is the most important part of what I'm telling you. These plaques and tangles begin 10 to 30 years before symptoms. It takes this long to get enough neuroinflammation to get the disease. You could substitute amyloid here with headbangs in the NFL. Another way to get tangles instead of amyloid is lots of bangs to the head. The football player gets bangs to the head in their teens, in their 20s, maybe their 30s, for Tom Brady, your 40s. Right? And um, 
These tangles then take decades to spread and cause forest fires, neuroinflammation, before you finally get CTE, something that football players get. So CTE is everything here tangles to inflammation, but instead of being induced by amyloid, it's by bangs to the head. But it's a similar type of disease. So think about COVID. COVID virus won't kill you. What's the COVID virus have to do to make you sick? Cause inflammation. You've all heard the term cytokine storm, right? This is a cytokine storm in the brain induced by plaques and tangles. And it takes 10 to 30 years before enough inflammation kills enough neurons, removes enough synapses to get the disease. This sounds like a terrible process, but the silver lining is it gives 10 to 30 year. We have an opportunity here with a 10 to 30 year window to detect this disease and prevent it before it actually leads to dementia. So that's just shown here that we've, once in a while we have people who die with what we call resilient brains. You have a person who died in their 80s. When they died, they were cognitively fine. And then the neuropathologist says, wait a minute, they're full of plaques and tangles. But they didn't have any cognitive problems. Then you say, well, was there any inflammation? Nope. Did the neurons die? Nope. Not enough of them. So you can have plaques and tangles brewing, but you have to induce the inflammation in the brain to get the neuronal loss to get the disease. And this is good news because most of us make plaques and tangles after the age of 40 or 50. But if you can keep that inflammation at bay, then you have a chance to stave off this disease. So two ways we're going to try to prevent this disease. We're going to try to hit the plaques and tangles early, de detect them, and get rid of them. Uh, we're also going to keep track of whether inflammation is brewing and stop that. And at the end, I'll tell you about a lifestyle strategy based on the last book I wrote on how to stop, neuro, on how to reduce neuroinflammation in your brain, since that's the final step to Alzheimer's. Any questions so far? One or two? Oh, is everything clear? Am I going the right level? Because if I'm... You can say I'm not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Amyloid is... So amyloid comes from the it's a Latin word for starch-like, right? I'm from Boston, starch like, right? So, because it's a sticky material. And there's different amyloids in the body. So you might have amyloid in the heart or the spleen. And different proteins, when they misfold the wrong way, get sticky and aggregate into gooey deposits called amyloid. And in the brain, when that happens, we call it beta amyloid. And it comes specifically from a little protein called amyloid beta protein which is made by the amyloid gene, which was the first Alzheimer's gene. And, we, and I, what I'll tell you at the end is that amyloid is made in the brain deliberately. Amyloid is used by the brain as an antimicrobial substance. It's for host defense. Amyloid, when you get an infection, like a virus or a bacteria from your gums that get into your brain, the amyloid sticks to it and binds it and forms a plaque around it to protect the brain. That's, that's one of the ways you can induce plaques in the brain. That's also why we don't want to wipe out amyloid. We just want to dial it down, just like we dial down cholesterol with statins. Yeah? If someone has experienced uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, yeah. will that impact their brain? Yeah, if you have a, tremendous, if you have a traumatic event, First of all, that can cause temporary amnesia. The brain deals with a terrible, terrible event by making you forget. And along with forgetting what happened, you forget a lot of what happened for 10 years before that. And that can subside. But also, if it's a bad enough traumatic shock, it can induce a lot of cortisol, the stress hormone in the brain, which kills neurons. And that can start to trigger inflammation and start a process going that may not be as reversible, but usually is reversible. So I'm going to go on, and this is our strategy for, for preventing Alzheimer's. Early prediction of the disease, looking at family history and genetics. Early detection, using biomarkers in the blood, spinal fluid imaging. And then finally, early intervention, nip it in the bud. Don't wait till the brain deteriorates. Stop it early, okay? So thanks to the Cure Alzheimer's Fund Alzheimer's Genome Project, which I've been co-directing since 2004, 
uh, directing, I say co-directing. I guess I give a lot of credit to my own geneticist. But I've been directing this project for now for um, almost 20 years. We have 100 Alzheimer's genes now, 100. And the earliest ones that we found, well, this is just how to think about Alzheimer's genes. This uh, y-axis here going up are the odds that the gene is going to cause the disease with certainty. So the amyloid gene and these other two genes that produce amyloid at high levels since birth are guaranteed to cause the disease. Early onset familial Alzheimer's. But on the x-axis is how frequent they are. So you can see that the mutations in these three familial early onset genes are really rare. They're back here, but they guarantee the disease. Then you have a whole slew of other ones. But here's ApoE. ApoE is the most prominent risk factor. How many of you have heard of ApoE as an Alzheimer's gene? Yeah, so ApoE also leads to amyloid, but ApoE only increases risk by about three-fold if you have one copy, 12-fold if both, family, both parents gave you a copy. So ApoE4, as it's called, is present in about 20% of the population, but is present in 50 to 60% of patients, and this E4 increases risk, and it's the, we consider it the most important risk factor because even though it doesn't guarantee disease like the early onset genes, it's so prominent, right? It's in 20% of the population at large. In fact, ApoE4, two, two copies of E4, which increases your risk for Alzheimer's 12-fold, is in 2% of the population, okay? So if you do a 23andMe test, they'll tell you your ApoE4. I would, if you, if you have two copies and you're concerned, I would get that retested at a genetic clinic for real because you can't always trust re recreational genetics like 23andMe. But it could give you an indicator that you have the E4 gene with a 23andMe test. So here's these first four genes we found. These were the three that I found. I found APP in 1986, and then I found these in 95. These are the three early onset familial genes. Um, and they all, they have over 500 mutations that guarantee the disease by 60 years old. No way around it. They all increase the amyloid. Here's ApoE4, which increases risk threefold with one copy, 12-fold with two copies, and again, amyloid. So all the first four genes said amyloid, amyloid, amyloid. I'll just tell you, if you go back to this list, all the new genes we're finding for late onset Alzheimer's all say inflammation. So the early onset genes that guarantee the disease, you make amyloid since birth. That's something you have to prevent early. The late onset genes get basically condition how much inflammation you're going to have in your brain in response to the plaques and tangles, together with your lifestyle. So for most, so the vast majority of these new genes, lifestyle will offset the effects. For ApoE4, one copy, lifestyle will offset the effects. And I also know people with two copies of E4 where lifestyle is offsetting the effects. So the good news is, you know, one or two percent of Alzheimer's guaranteed, 98% of it can be offset by lifestyle, okay? So how do we know that things are happening? We have MRI for brain shrinkage. We have PET scans for plaques and tangles. There is now, this is the blood test I said, C2N, if you want the blood test. This is a company in St. Louis called C2N, started by uh, uh, my co-director of the research leadership group at Cure Alzheimer's Fund, Dave Holtzman. And you can find out if you have amyloid in your brain with a C2N test. You can find out if you have tangles in your brain with a blood test. And you can find out if neurons are dying with a blood test. You can even, to some extent, find out if there's neuroinflammation with a blood test. Okay? And the main blood test available here is the amyloid and tangle one. We also have digital technologies. We can do eye scanning with high resolution because as pathology accumulates in the brain, the eyes won't track as well with a test. Just like after concussion, you know, follow my finger. But picture a, a, a device that can track eye movement to nanoseconds. And that's what the Dig React Neuro company I started with. But most importantly, what can we do about the disease if you detect it early? How can we intervene? And here I want to use a dragon analogy, okay? A little Game of Thrones, a house of a dragon, right? So early prevention, you have to hit the plaques and tangles. 10, 20, 30 years before symptoms. That means if there's a dragon who's going to threaten your village, you find the nest of the dragon and you slay it before he gets there. That's how we have to stop Alzheimer's in the future. What do we do now? We wait for the dragon 
to get to the village. Inflammation. This dragon is scorching the villagers. We're hoping for the best. They run as fast as they can. They're trying to protect themselves against this fire, but the inflammation is going on. So for treating the disease in patients, you have to protect them against this dragon who's already there breathing fire. The inflammation has started. But the future will be we find that dragon nest. We detect the plaques and tangles and get rid of them early on. So we're not going to give up on the villagers, right? But it's a different strategy to help them than how you prevent the disease by finding the dragon's nest. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's, that's going to be the big change. And so let's talk about therapies that get rid of the amyloid. Well, you probably all heard about Lakembi and Agihome, the two anti-amyloid drugs that were just approved. Um, the newest one is Lakembi. Um, like I said, both of these cost about 100000 a year when you factor in the MRIs you need. To, to make sure you don't have any brain swelling or, or hemorrhage. Uh, people on blood thinners cannot take them. Three, three people who died on these drugs uh, had hemorrhages that were not reversible because they were on blood thinners, so blood thinners would, would basically prevent use. Um, and so with Lakembi, with a large study of the earliest, earliest stage, mildest possible patients, there was a huge study for a year and a half. They found that statistical significance that they could slow decline of, of the patient by 27%. Now, most clinicians debate whether this is clinically meaningful. Certainly, if you had a family member with Alzheimer's and they took this drug, you would not notice a difference. You, you, you might be slowing down their course of disease by 27%. It might keep them out of a nursing home for a couple of extra months, but you won't notice the difference. And that's because hitting amyloid, although it's a great thing to do, and this drug is the best drug out there for hitting amyloid, Lakembi. It does get rid of the amyloid. But it's, it's arguably should be used for prevention. But I told you there are 40 million people who need it. How do you give a $100,000 a year drug to 40 million people? You can't. There's going to just be a small slice of, when, if this gets approved in July, you know, full approval, it will be for a small slice of the Alzheimer's population that are the earliest, mildest stage. But for those who can afford it, they'll say, hey, I'm going to get the test. I want to find out if I have amyloid, and I'm going to pay $100,000. My brain's worth it. I'm going to get rid of my amyloid, wipe the slate clean. Okay? So that's where we're at right now. And even though this is not necessarily a, 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 a democratized way to get everybody the help they need, it's opened the door at the FDA. So now what I'm going to tell you next is that Cure Alzheimer's Fund, for the past, well, 15, now 15, 20 years, has been developing small molecule pills, alternatives that can do this at a much cheaper and a much safer way. So we're going to ride the wave of what these, you know, kind of cumbersome immunotherapies that are not so safe and really expensive, and that opened the door at the FDA, because the FDA door was closed shut. And now there's a foot in the door holding it open. So we go in there and say, we have a, a little white pill, or we have a combination of known drugs that are already safe to do the same thing. But we want to treat the 40 million people who don't have the disease yet and prevent the disease. Let us do that. And then check back five or 10 years from now at real world evidence to see if we haven't dramatically reduced the incidence and prevalence of this disease. That's our vision. The FDA is going to have to work with us. But these antibodies, as controversial as they are, expensive, not particularly safe, caused a lot of debate, they did open the door. The silver lining is it opens the door for now cheaper, safer drugs that do the same thing. And I want to tell you about the first one. So here's, you probably recognize Julianne Moore, won the Oscar for Still Alice. She played a patient with early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. And for those of you who saw Still Alice, and I showed you that Alois Alzheimer's slide, Lisa Genova, who wrote the book, is a good friend of mine. She was my classmate. And a little known secret, we gave uh, Alice the same early onset mutation that August Dieter, Alzheimer's patient, had. Because we were able to get a whole of brain tissue from 1906 from Alzheimer's original 55-year-old patient. And she had a, a mutation in one of the genes I found called presenolin. And so, she had the same mutation, so from, from August to Alice, we used to say. So one day, in a more serious note, I had a woman come into my office, and she was in a family where the mom 
had Alzheimer's by 45 years old. And uh, her uncle had Alzheimer's by 45 years old. And they had a mutation in the amyloid gene. It was actually the first mutation in the amyloid gene, called the London mutation. And she was about 30 years old, and she, said, and she had two kids who were like, I think, five and six. And she said, so I know I have the gene mutation, so does this mean I want to have full-blown Alzheimer's when I'm 45? Like, is it, does this mean that when my kids are in college, I'm not going to know their names? Picture 30 years old, thinking by the time my kids are entering college, I'm not going to know their names. It hit me so hard. And I have a collaborator, Steve Wagner, who tragically passed away last year um, from kind of a rapid heart failure. And, he, and I called him, he's from Louisville, um, very gentle guy, and I called him that night and I told him the story about this woman in my office. This was probably around the beginning of 2000. And, um, and he just, there was a long pause on the phone because it hit him like it hit me, like it probably hit you, what she said. And he said, man, Rudy, we gotta help her. We gotta do something for her. I'm like, and like I said, well, you know what? Why don't we just learn from the genetics, study those mutations, see what goes wrong, and those, those three genes I showed you that guarantee the disease early, let's study what they do in common, and then let's design a drug screen to reverse it. So that when people in her family get this mutation, they can take our drug and it neutralizes it. And if it's going to be lower amyloid, we could use it like a statin, like cholesterol. We can use it in everybody who finds out they have high amyloid to bring their amyloid down. And we call this drug, we call this drug gamma secretase modulator. I won't get into the specifics of how it works. But at the time, pharma was doing all kinds of other things, big pharma, and they were developing drugs that we knew weren't going to be safe. And when one farmer does it, they all follow each other. Well, drug after drug to get a small pill that hits amyloid failed in pharma because of safety. And because they all copied each other, they all went off the, 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 the ledge together like lemmings, okay? So here we are today, thanks to Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and the NIH, 20 years later, $25 million of investment, and, and we're in academia, and we're last man standing. It's crazy. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating this at all. We are the final group in the world who has a drug that could be a small pill that's cheap and safe, that can be an alternative to those expensive antibodies that will bring your amyloid down. As you might imagine, pharma is knocking on the door. Um, I'm happy to say that on March 21st, we submitted our investigation of new drug application after 20 years to the FDA. And the clock is ticking. We have 30 days to tell us if we can start our clinical trials. And we fully hope to start our first clinical trial in May. And this drug, I, that 30-year-old woman who started taking this drug, it would neutralize the amyloid so it doesn't go any further. And for those people who get a C2N test and a PET scan that says you have amyloid brewing, this drug will bring your amyloid down. We have to hope it's safe. Because if it's safe, it's going to work. And we did this you know, kind of under the radar, Cure Alzheimer's Fund believed in us, if it wasn't for them, and then that allowed us to leverage, like, you know, the NIH funding uh, to, to keep going, we wouldn't have gotten here. So it's a very exciting time. And this drug, which you're looking at here, this drug could become the Lipitor of Alzheimer's. No exaggeration. This is a possibility now. So that's what I'm saying. Thanks to Cure Alzheimer's Fund, 20 years of research, phase one clinical trials, Assuming that yet the FDA lets us through and we made sure this thing is going to pass muster, we'll start in May of 2023. So that's how we slay the dragon. That's how we get rid of those plaques early on, right? What about people who have the disease right now where we have to stop neuroinflammation or protect them against the dragon? And here we have to study a little cell called the microglia. How many of you heard, about a, heard of a microglia? Oh, good, some people. So microglia is uh, an immune cell in the brain, and it has three roles. It's a housekeeper. While you sleep at night, it cleans up amyloid and other debris. It's also a sentinel. It's always on the lookout for pathogens like microbes, viruses, bacteria, and also dead cells. If it either gobbles up 
a microbe, or a dead cell, it assumes when there's a dead cell there's an infection. These microglial cells uh, never got the memo of how, of how long we live now. And if they see a dead cell, they assume it's an infection, and then they become a killer warrior, cytokine storm, inflammation, and now you get that massive cell death that leads to the disease. So the amyloid that builds up, normally these microglial cells try to clean it. But as amyloid causes too many tangles and kills nerve cells, that gives a signal to the microglia to stop being a housekeeper, throw off the apron, become a killer, because their mandate through evolution is protect the brain against infection. And when they see nerve cells dying, they assume it's an infection, even if it's not. So this is a really interesting piece of information that most people don't know. So here's what we gotta, here's what we gotta do. We gotta turn the killer microglial cells back into housekeepers. And this is where cure Alzheimer's fund comes in again because they allowed us to do something crazy, which was Alzheimer's in a dish, where we fully recreated what takes 10 to 30 years in a brain of a patient. We create in a pea-sized mini human brain organoid in 30 days. 30 years of progression of disease in 30 days. So this is May, and Du Yan Kim championed this in my lab, he's shown here. Um, and this has revolutionized drug discovery, because now, in the old days, you take a drug off the shelf and you say, hey, I bet you this drug might help in Alzheimer's. Okay, do the mouse study, it's gonna take two years, right? Now, we, we can have these 96 well plates, 96 wells, each one has a mini brain organoid in it, screen 96 drugs at a time over 30 days and see that they stop, which ones stop the amyloid, which ones prevent the tangles, which ones stop the inflammation, and all, all in a month, 96 at a time. So this has made drug discovery 100 times faster, 100 times cheaper. For the last five years, Cure Alzheimer's funded what's called 3DDS. This is called a 3D, Alzheimer's edition is a 3D culture model, it's called. 3D drug discovery, 3D drug screening, 3DDS. So for the last five years, seven years actually, with about $5 million from Cure Alzheimer's Fund, we've screened every approved drug you can buy at CVS. It's about 1,400 of them, 1,500. We have screened thousands of natural products, including supplements you can buy on Amazon. Anything that's known to be safety, you can take. As a drug or a supplement, we screened it and say, do any of them work? And here's the system where we did it. This is this dish. Now, I don't want to get into deep, but you have plaques, you got tangles, you got the microglial cells, you got inflammation. Let me just show you one thing. These are regular, in green, these are human neurons in, a, in an artificial mini brain. And the blue guys are microglia. And this is peaceful coexistence. This is what happens when you sleep at night, right after you dream, during deep sleep. These little microglial cells gobble up your amyloid and clean your brain. That's why sleep is so important. But if those nerve cells are making plaques and tangles, watch what the microglial cells do. They eat the neurons. They say, we've got to wipe everything out here. There's an infection. No, there's not an infection. It was just plaques and tangles. We all got them. We live long enough. Yeah, well, I was programmed when people lived till 25 years old on the savannah, and if neurons died, that was an infection, and I was still programmed the same way. That's what causes Alzheimer's. The plaques and tangles set the stage, initiate, and these guys come in and they do their business. We've got all this happening in addition, 30 days. We screened everything over the last seven years, and now we got this. We found 61 different known drugs and natural products that get those same microglial cells to clear the amyloid. Guess what Lakembi, the antibody does? Lakembi, Adjahelm, they get microglial cells to eat the amyloid. Expensive, unsafe. We have 61 known safe drugs and natural products that do the same thing. We get the microglial cells to clear the amyloid. We got 81 different drugs and natural products that stop the amyloid from causing the tangles. Stops the match from lighting the brush fires. And 68 different ones that stop neuroinflammation. Stop those microglial cells from getting upset. Stop them from eating all the neurons. This took seven years, $5 million, cure Alzheimer's funding. And now we're gonna make combinations of these. You might ask, why combinations? And this is where you have to be commercially savvy, right? If you do a trial with one of these drugs and it works, 
And now, let's say that's a small trial. And now it works and you want to raise $100 million to do a big trial. Who's going to give you $100 million for a known drug? Right? It's already generic. It's already, there's no, you, you know, you can't even get a patent. Any drug you Google with Alzheimer's, you're going to find what the patent office will say is prior art. We need to patent, we need patents to, to make these drugs that are repurposed from known drugs commercially viable. So the way we do that is we make combinations, okay? So here's the screen, 3,500 drugs and natural products, 2014 to present, $5 million, identified over 200 to hit different pathologies. Then we made combinations that work the best, but we focus on combinations that are not obvious. So when they go to the patent office, we can say, here's a combination. You would never think this drug and that drug would do this. The combination is a new drug. It's not for money. It's not to make money. It's because later, after you do your first successful clinical trial, you want to get a pharma company to spend $100 million on the second trial. Who's going to do it without protection? They want IP. So this is how you get IP on known drugs, by making combinations with surprising, unexpected effects that are patentable. So we've done that now, and we have 50, 50 different combinations in the pipeline ready to go into clinical trials. What do we do for trials? We just ask, can we see in a patient what we saw in the dish? We take all these biomarkers I told you about for plaques and tangles and inflammation. We treat the patients with the combination, and then we look at their blood biomarkers and say, are we engaging our target? Are we getting into the brain, hitting the amyloid or the tangles? Are we seeing in, in the brain of a patient what we saw in the dish? And if we do, that, each of those trials costs two to three million dollars. We do about 50 of them. And for each one that looks good, then you go to pharma, big pharma, and you say, we want to do a $100 million trial. Here's the intellectual property. Here's the, the data to back it up. Let's go. And it's going to be a very short route to approval because this is not a new drug. These are known drugs. They're already safe. And the proof of the concept came at a company called Amelix, which Cure Alzheimer's Fund helped fund and got into. Amelix started with two kids from Brown University. They were undergrads. And they wrote to me for a meeting in 2013. And normally I relegate undergrads to somebody in the lab. But two things were different. They were Sigma Chi members. I was a Sigma Chi fraternity member. <laughs> and that year I was voted into the Sigma Chi Hall of Fame with Brad Pitt, significant thing. <laughs> Neither of us went to the ceremony. Brad Pitt heard I wasn't going, you know, so. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, they, and also one of the kids, Josh Cohen, went K to 12 at Milton Academy, where my daughter's a freshman. So I'm like, okay, I got the Milton Academy connection, got the Sigma Chi connection, I'll take the meeting. And so they, say, they said, look, we have an idea where, um, you know, we have a list of drugs, and we want, to do t we want to protect the neuron from dying from inflammation based on your work at two different spots. And we got this list of drugs that work at spot A, and this list of drugs at spot B, we want, we want to work with you to pick one. So we picked these two drugs. These, this is a natural product you can buy on Amazon. Terso. This one is also a natural product, it's a, but it, you, it, it's a prescribed drug. And we combined them, and we did studies in the lab, and I designed an experiment for them that was guaranteed to fail. That's what you want to show them, that scientists set out to disprove your hypothesis, and whatever holds up, you use to design your next experiment. So we take the neurons in the dish, we pour hydrogen peroxide on them, they all die. This is inflammation times a million. And I said, let's see how many of the neurons these two drugs could get together could save. They came back and they said, look, we saved 90% of the neurons. I'm like, no, you didn't. You, you can't save 90% of the neurons from hydrogen peroxide. We're going to do it again, and this time I'm watching. And we did it again, 95%. So, they started this little company called Amelix because they were entrepreneurial kids. And uh, Cure Alzheimer's Fund helped them early on to do this. And we did a trial in ALS, and it worked. And now these two drugs together are called Relivrio in the U.S. Alveosa, they're the newest approved drugs for ALS as of September. And the group that works with Medicare to determine how good relative drugs are to each other say that this drug that we came up with, started with those two kids, is nine times better than the existing ALS drug, using a repurposed combination with its own IP so you could create a drug. 
So this is proof of concept of this model. And by the way, the same drug is looking pretty good in the Alzheimer's trials as well. We just finished a phase two. So we're applying the same strategy now, doing combinations. Which ones stimulate uptake of amyloid? Which ones prevent the neuroinflammation? This just shows some nat natural products that work, like cat's claw, urolithin A. Nicotinamide riboside is probably the most promising here. Um, Fisitin, resveratrol, genistein, which is high in uh, soy and, and uh, tofu. That's just th three examples. Now we, and we take these and we make combinations that have what are called synergistic effects. And we're focusing a lot right now on trials with nicotinamide riboside. I put true niogen here. I am uh, a, a very poorly paid consultant for the company that makes true niogen. But I only did it because the CEO of the company that makes true niogen public, uh, produced the movie Rudy. <laughs> so Rudy never give up. I'm like, this is meant to be Rob Fried. So uh, this is the one that's farthest along. I would never say take a supplement unless there's a clinical trial, right? All these things you see on TV with jellyfish, whatever, there's no trials. They say, clinically tested, well, what are the results? <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of, there's a, you know, look, there's a lot of snake oil out there. You gotta be careful. In, in, in real science, we have to do clinical trials before we make claims. And I would say this one's the farthest along with a new phase two trial that looked good and some other things going on. And that was one of the hits on my screen, but we have these others as well. So now we're making these combinations and we're hoping for the best. We're going to take our new drug that I told you about to hit the amyloid. We're going to take these combinations, hit the different pathologies, start doing these trials. And um, we're doing it, these at the McCant Center, um, uh, the McCant Center for uh, Brain Health, which Henry McCants, who's one of the, with Phyllis, one of the founders of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund. And Cure Alzheimer's Fund got this all going with the drug screen and the Alzheimer's and DISH model. So it's a new era. It's a new era in Alzheimer's disease. And we're hoping we can do for Alzheimer's what we did with these two kids for ALS with repurposed drugs and just two new drugs. So for the last five, ten minutes, um, I'm just going to just mention what can we do with lifestyle. These are some of the, we're working on a lifestyle trial. Some of you may recognize Dean Ornish, who the Dean Ornish diet for heart disease. We're doing a lifestyle trial with him. And I like to encapsulate at the, at the McCann Center, our brain care score looks at all of these different things. If you want to take your brain, care score, brain care test, you can uh, scan that code and take the, um, take the test. So this is what we do at the McCann Center is we, we basically, you take this test to see how you're doing in terms of your brain health. It's called a brain care score. And if you ask what is the um, actual uh, basis of the brain care score, it's based on what we call the six pillars of brain health. And I wrote about these in my last book, but I had to come up with an acronym and I came up with the acronym SHIELD, your brain, SHIELD. And SHIELD is here. It stands for sleep, handling stress, interaction with others, exercise, learn new things, and diet. Let me just quickly go through these. Try to get sleep seven to eight, eight hours a day, even if you have a nap. It's during that deep sleep right after you dream that your brain clears out amyloid. It's when you get those microglial cells to eat the amyloid. Okay, so that's one way to clear amyloid and other debris from your brain. Even if you have a power nap and you have a little bit of REM, and then some deep sleep, drool a little bit on the desk, that's one rinse cycle for the brain. Okay, with a microglial cell. I, I picture like the amyloid coming out of my drool. Um, so sleep. Handling stress. Look, stress causes um, inflammation. It causes cortisol, which triggers inflammation. And, um, you know, so meditation practice can be good. Uh, just learning how to manage stress. We have two mantras we use. If someone's super stressed out, we, we tell them to say the words, I'm okay right now, and it's only right now. That calms them down. If you're just overly stressed in general, we have another mantra, which is no worry, no hurry, no sorry. Because when you worry too much, you hurry up. When you hurry up, you make mistakes, and then you gotta say, I'm sorry. So no worry, no hurry, no sorry. It's a great, great mantra. Um, and then we did a meditation study that was controlled we, that wasn't with dogs, I just like these pictures. But we had, th uh, <laughs> we, we had 30 women doing a meditation course, 30 at the same resort just having fun, eating the same food, and we found those that meditated had huge beneficial changes in their genome uh, that were indicative of less inflammation, less Alzheimer's-related biomarkers, and even improved telomerase activity, you know, the anti-aging enzyme. So that was a meditation study. Interaction with others. Interaction with others is important because loneliness meaning being alone and not liking it. 
as opposed to being alone and liking it. But being alone and not liking it, that, that stress is bad. And the interaction with others is also helps uh, you know, get new synapses going. Loneliness has been shown to increase risk for Alzheimer's through full. Exercise. So exercise does two things that are great. Exercise induces the birth of new neurons in the short-term memory area that's affected by Alzheimer's. We showed this in a paper in Science. We figured out how exercise does this. Now we're trying to mimic this with, with combinations of drugs and natural products in those same screens I told you about. So aim at 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. Okay, just doesn't have to be uh, totally aerobic. Just try to get your heart rate up 50%. Walking, brisk walk, bike, whatever, for 150 minutes a week. Okay, and what happens is, to, besides growing these new neurons in your brain in that brain region, this is really cool. This is brand new, and we just the paper is now. It was funded by Cure Alzheimer's Fund, and it's uh, under review. It's almost in press. But when you exercise, your muscles make this little hormone called irisin. The iris in, in your bloodstream gets into your brain and it triggers an, the production of an enzyme that breaks down the amyloid. So instead of getting the microglial cells to eat the amyloid like sleep does, you can get enzymatic breakdown of the amyloid with exercise by getting muscle-derived hormone called iris and going into the brain. And we published this in Nature um, Aging. We have another paper in Press in Nature Neuroscience. These are high-impact journals. So it's really cool that something made from muscle can get into the brain and then turn on an enzyme from a cell called an astrocyte that breaks down the amyloid. So that's why exercise is good. Ellers learn new things. The more synapses you make by learning new things, the more you can lose before you lose it. It's that simple. Synaptic reserve should be as important for you as financial reserve. Right? You, as you lose synapses with age, you want to be making new ones. So learning new things, like you're learning new things right now, which is helping you. And for some of you, if I'm putting you to sleep, I'm still helping you. So it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? So you want, you, want, you, want to, you want to build up your synaptic reserve by learning new things. So brain games are good for teaching you to focus that helps you to learn. But the key is learning could just be watching a documentary, learning something new, TV, book, learning a new hobby. Anytime something is new being learned by the brain, you're creating new synapses and you're those are connecting to older ones by association and reinforcing your neural network, okay? Diet, very simple, Mediterranean diet, okay? Less red meat, more fish, and especially plant-based protein, fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds, leafy greens, whole grains. Why? Plant-based fiber keeps your gut microbiome bacteria happy, and we have published several papers showing when your gut microbiome bacteria, right, trillions of bacteria in your gut, 5,000 different species. When they're happy, they induce clearance of amyloid by the microglia. Your gut, and, and we don't know exactly how yet, but we can modulate the gut bacteria to get signals to the brain to get the microglial cells to eat amyloid. We've shown this. So some people take probiotics. That's great. You're taking six of the 5,000 bacteria in your gut, six species of the 5,000 maybe a billion of them, but with, with prebiotics, meaning plant-based diet and fiber, you're feeding those bacteria, making them happy, and they're going to then induce the clearance of amyloid in the brain, among other things. Also, blueberries, green tea, dark chocolate, even red wine as antioxidants, not in excess, cut down on fats, sugar, carbohydrates, junk food, processed foods to promote inflammation. Okay, so that's the diet. That would be for diet. Now, recently, I came up with Shield 2.0 recently means yesterday. Because <laughs> I said, this isn't enough. I got to tell them also what's bad or what you got to really do to keep track of things. This is part of that brain care score. So number one, smoking, don't. Very simple. Hypertension, manage your blood pressure. Because high blood pressure is one of the main causes of neurovascular injury and stroke, which is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Manage your blood pressure. Infection. If you get recurring herpes, cold sores, um, talk to your doctor about an antiviral, gancyclovir, acyclovir. Don't leave herpes, recurring herpes infections and cold sores unattended because herpes in the brain induces amyloid. Okay? Amyloid was evolved to trap viruses and bacteria 
and form plaques around them. When there's a microbe in the brain and it encounters the amyloid beta protein, you will make a plaque. And that means you also are now inducing tangles. And even the tangles, believe it or not, inside the neurons help prevent the virus from spreading from neuron to neuron. This pathology evolved as a host defense system. Now it works against us. So take care of herpes infections with an antiviral. And also, in general, all, most vaccines, pneumonia, COVID, tuberculosis, Shingrix, have all been associated with reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease. So vaccines, there's data upon data now suggesting that if you take care of these common pathogens that trigger infection, you protect your brain. There's, the data are really pretty clear that vaccines protect against Alzheimer's disease, even the COVID vaccine in early days. E, excess alcohol. I like alcohol. I like an old-fashioned. I like red wine. Just don't do too much of it. You know, moderate your drinking, so E is excess. L, lipids. Manage your cholesterol levels. Obviously, keep your cholesterol down. How many of you are on statins in here? Yeah, me too. Great. And finally, D, this one's going to be surprising. Dental hygiene. You need to floss because we did a study where for the last five years, again, we cure Alzheimer's fund, and we asked if we look at hundreds of Alzheimer's postmortem brains and hundreds of brains from controls who didn't have any disease, are there any microbes that were more abundant in the Alzheimer's brain? And the only positive data we got were periodontal bacteria, gum bacteria bacteria that are associated with gingivitis and periodontal disease. They get into the brain. They trigger amyloid. Okay? Our society does not care enough about keeping our gums clean. Our gums are a source of major infection for the brain. So you got to floss, see your periodontist, routine dentistry. This will go a long way to, to also help reduce amyloid. So that's the new SHIELD 2.0. You're the first audience to hear SHIELD uh, 2.0. So um, see, so you can shield against the dragon, right? I had to use the shield against the dragon here. Um, and I'm going to summarize now what I just told you with this. Sleep more, relax more, socialize more, move more, learn more, eat plants more, check your numbers more, fl floss more, and because I'm a geneticist, choose your ancestors, your parents and ancestors wisely. So I'm going to stop there. Hopefully we have time for some, some questions. And thank you very much for your attention.